Hi there, my name is David Canney. Welcome to Light From Above. Glad you could be with us on the program today. You know, at each one of our programs we start out, I always try to flash out the picture of our building, uh, our address, and our meeting times. And, and we do that uh, to make sure that you know when the church is meeting at that building. And that hopefully if you're in the area and you're available, that you'll come in and you'll uh, stop and uh, worship with us, maybe study the Bible together with us and that uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet other Christians in our town, in our area, and that we'll have a chance to meet you. And I want you to know that you're always uh, a guest in our services, and we would love to have you. Today we're talking about Colossians. We're continuing our study, and this is part 20 of our series. And the title of this series is Pray, Walk, and Talk Right. Now, it's important to keep in mind a little bit of background information about this epistle. The Apostle Paul... It taught in a school at Ephesus some time ago, uh, which is about 120 miles west of Colossae. And this is during his third missionary journey. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 19, 9 through 10. And it's believed that he converted someone there when he was teaching in that school. And that man's name was Epaphras. And some time has gone by, Apostle Paul has moved on, and he ends up actually being in prison in Rome. And Epaphras goes to him, apparently, and brings some troubles that he's having in the area where he's ministering. And that would include Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. And the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to help address some of the things that Epaphras was facing. And so it's important to keep in mind, the Apostle Paul, you know, it's not like he's sitting in some rich, lavish mansion. And he's got, you know, of course, they didn't have cars back then. But, you know, you look at some people in, in, in some religions, and they have a huge mansion, they have big cars and yachts and, and all this kind of stuff. And they tell you about, you know, how to live your life and everything. And sometimes you sort of, you're like, well, that's, you know, that's easy for you to say. Well, the Apostle Paul is in prison. And these are the things that he's telling us that we need to pay attention to. So let's take a look at the idea of pray, walk, and talk right. And this is from Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6. And let's read it together. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains, that I, make, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So we're basically going to talk about three different ideas. Pray vigilantly. Also walk wisely. And then speak graciously. You remember for a Christian, it's not, you know, we're, not, we're supposed to get rid of bad characteristics. Maybe characteristics that we've had in our lives that are bad that we need to get rid of. And we need to bring in new characteristics. People should recognize and see that we're followers of Christ. And being a follower of Christ is more than just having a magnet on your car or some slogan on your license plate. Or, you know, they should be able to tell by the, you know, the way that we conduct our lives. They should know that we're different. And that's important that we need to keep in mind. We'll just take a look at the first one, the idea of praying vigilantly. You know, the term there, continuing earnestly, it means to adhere to, to persist in, to busy oneself with it, to be busily engaged or devoted to it is what one resource I looked at stated about it. And so the idea is not just something that you, you do maybe before you eat a meal. Uh, sometimes, you know, that's all the time people will pray, or maybe just when you get up or before you go to bed. But you're to continue earnestly in prayer and to be vigilant. The idea of being vigilant means to watch, to be watchful in it. And some, some translations render that word watchful in it. Well, it's a metaphorical term. It means to give strict attention to, to be cautious about it, to be active in it. It's the same term that uh, Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went to his disciples and said, watch. You know, <laughs> why? Pay attention to what's going on. Be attentive. Uh, that's the same kind of term. You know, there's power in prayer. And that's something that, you know, sometimes people don't recognize. Or maybe people take it for granted. For example, if prayer was without any purpose, you know, some people think that then why would Paul tell them to be watchful? If it, if it didn't really accomplish anything, you know, there's some people that claim to be religious people, they, they say, well, you know, prayer doesn't really do anything. Well, 
Why would Paul tell us to pray, continue earnestly in prayer, being watchful? What were we watching for if there wasn't any benefit to it? Well, you know, prayer was a key aspect in the Apostle Paul's relationship as an apostle. And remember what I told you? He's in prison. So it's not like he's telling you advice of things that, you know, well, he, he experienced hardship. And he's telling you that, and it's important to remember. You know, tragically, many have become over-imperialistic, uh, rationalistic. They don't even believe in the power of prayer anymore. And that's really sad. Christians cannot allow that to happen to themselves. Paul believed in the power of prayer, even through all the adversity he went through. We should believe it as well. One of the ingredients that Paul mentioned in our prayers, in that, in that passage there, in it with thanksgiving. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you treat prayer like a letter to Santa Claus? I want these things. Do, 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 do. Or, you know, maybe it's a litany of complaints or petitions. Or, or maybe, you know, maybe you're, uh, you're, you're, you're sick, you're going through some kind of difficulty. I'm not trying to minimize those kinds of things. But I want you to think about is, are you thankful? Are you thankful towards God for all that he does, for all that he provides, the sun, the rain, the air we breathe, the things that he has blessed us in our lives? Let me, let me give you something to think about. What if God blessed you in relationship to how much you thanked him? How would that work out for you? How thankful are you to God for what he provides? It's something we need to give thought about. Notice the Apostle Paul does not ask for a door of escape. He's in prison. He could have asked for that, but that's not what he asked for. He asked for opportunity, a door of opportunity. Do we pray for doors of opportunity to share the gospel with others, or do we hope that somebody else will do it? You know, do, what do we do with that? If somebody wants to talk to us about the Bible, do we try to you know, get away from them? Or are we willing to do that? Do we pray for opportunities for people to come and be able to talk to us and ask us a question about the Bible? I know sometimes it's intimidating to have somebody come up and ask you a question. You're not really prepared for it. I mean, some people think that you just walk around and you have this encyclopedic knowledge and that you can just, they can just pull a question out of anywhere and they expect you to be able to answer it on the spot. Sometimes we put ourselves in that kind of pressure and we're reluctant to talk to people when they have questions. Sometimes the best answer to that kind of question is to say, I don't know, but let me do some research. Or let me think about your question, and let me get back to you. Don't be afraid to talk to people. And I hope, you know, as I go through town here and I see people, and sometimes they'll look at me and they'll smile, they'll nod, and I think that they're probably watching the show. And I hope that they know that if they want to ask a question or they want to talk to me, they're more than welcome to. I may be busy at the moment, but that doesn't mean I don't want to talk to you. And so hopefully you will not be afraid of such or something like that. But do we not do that? I mean, do we not talk to people about Jesus? You know, it's a very hostile environment right now for Christianity in a lot of ways. And some people, you know, they're afraid that they're going to be punished if they do it. Now, the question is, the fear, is the fear stopping you from doing it? And there's not even any punishment. Is it just the idea of punishment that's keeping you from doing it? Don't allow yourself to fall into that trap. Pray for opportunities. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. He wanted to be able to preach it plainly, manifestly, openly, so there would be no missing the message for all those who would listen. Preachers ought to covet the prayers of, the, of Christians who will have the opportunity, the power to preach the word of Christ as we have opportunity. It's one of the reasons why we do this TV program. It isn't that we're just doing a program to compete in some award ceremony or you know, just something to do, something to give the preacher something to do to fill up his day. There's nothing like that. What we're really interested in is talking to people about the Bible and about their soul and, and, and taking an interest in their lives. And that's what Churches of Christ are about. And hopefully you will take advantage of that. Well, number two, walk wisely. Now, to walk means more than just sort of strolling around. That's, it's a little more involved than that. Sometimes business leaders will talk about the phrase walking the talk. 
you know, we have to talk the talk, walk the talk, talk the walk, you know, all that. Sometimes I'm afraid to even use that expression. I'm afraid I'm going to twist it up my tongue trying to say it. But employers are often talking about the phrase, you know, we need to walk the talk. Well, you know, as Christians, we need to do that. And notice the source of wisdom is, you know, from the prior verse, it's God's Word. That is the source of wisdom. I love quoting. I love books about quotations and different ones. I, I enjoy quotations by uh, just a whole, it doesn't really necessarily matter who the person is, although that definitely takes a uh, factor into it. But I love quotes by presidents or scientists such as Albert Einstein, uh, maybe uh, major leaders in our country like Lincoln or Reagan or Jefferson or Washington, uh, those people, or leaders in other worlds like Gandhi, uh, or maybe uh, non-political leaders in our country from the past like Martin Luther King and others. You know, I, I appreciate well-spoken thoughts that challenge us to be better, and I always appreciate those kinds of things or, or to get us to think. And that's important that we know. But as important as those things are, we need to recognize that the treasure of information is in God's Word. It's a treasure compared to those. And really, the people who really make the most outstanding quotations, you could probably find the same thing in the Bible or something similar to it. And that's important we need to know. The expression, those who are outside, is talking about those outside the door from the previous verse, those who aren't Christians. The Apostle Paul was interested in persuading others to come through the door, to become Christians. And that's what we are to be involved in. But, you know, some people don't understand that. Some people don't understand Christians. As a matter of fact, some people think Christianity is just a bunch of foolishness. But you know what? It's interesting the Apostle Paul pointed that out. Some people think that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. See, some people who don't understand Christianity, they don't understand the Bible, and they're looking at it from afar, they think it's foolish. But if they really would take the time to really study the matter, and they might need some help, they might need some help to study it. Sometimes, you know, when I'm going, when I was in corporate industry and I would have to go learn something I wasn't familiar with, I had to have help. I had to have training. I had to go to class. I had to ask questions. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And maybe you'd like to know more about the Bible and you just don't know where to start. Well, maybe you want to subscribe to a Bible correspondence course. And that way you can study on your own. If you have questions, you can ask someone. You know, we, there's, there's nothing ashamed, to be ashamed of if you don't know. The shame is if you allow yourself to keep yourself from knowing. And that's important. You know, when we walk wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Now, the term redeeming there is interesting in Colossians 4, 5. That term redeeming has the idea, it's a compound word. The one, exo, that's the first part of it, means out of. And then agora is a marketplace. So the idea is to buy it out of the marketplace. That's a term redeeming. And the term time has the idea, it's not just time on a watch, but it's opportunity. You know, those are outside redeeming the time. You know, what does redeeming the time mean? It's an intriguing expression. I often thought, you know, well, maybe that means making up for lost time. But can you really make up for lost time? Sadly, we cannot make up for lost time, but we can make most of the time that we still have. And it's something that, you know, we need to take advantage of. And the idea, it's interesting, you know, that term redeeming, out of the marketplace. And I want you to think about this. As you go through your day, how often do you, you know, the marketplace of ideas. You know, we're all talking about ideas. We're talking about strategies. You know, we may talk about it in different ways. We may talk about sports, baseball, football. We might talk about politics. We might, you know, we have a whole bunch of things to talk about. We might talk about you know, playing um, in a play or playing in an orchestra. Or we might just talk about, you know, home improvement projects and all that. Yeah, you know, it's like a marketplace of ideas. How often do we take from that marketplace and say, well, let's talk a little bit about the Bible. Let's talk a little bit about Christianity. Let's talk about does God exist. Let's talk about, you know, this passage in the Bible. Do you even know the Bible? How often do we actually uh, initiate a conversation with someone about, you know, maybe we ought to talk about this a little bit. I was reading this book, and this book was interesting. And I was, uh, it's interesting, I was talking to someone in the library not too long ago, and they were looking for a certain book, a religious book. And, and the, book, the library didn't have it, it was too new. 
But I told this person about another book, and I thought, well, that's, that's really sort of nice because now she's looking for that book. And she told me about a book, and I was sort of interested about it. Well, how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen unless we make those opportunities, unless we take it out of the marketplace or put things into the marketplace. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. You know, people are listening and watching you all the time. They are all the time. And there's people out there that they won't hesitate for a moment. If they see some inconsistency or if you make a mistake, they're going to say, well, there's a hypocrite. That person's not even a Christian. And when you have people like that, they'll do that. And we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're trying to be perfected. We're trying to strive to be better. But we're not perfect people. We make mistakes. We commit sin. We make errors and things like that. But we can't allow that fear of someone to say, oh, you know what, I found out you made this mistake over here. You're not perfect. And so, therefore, and they try to intimidate you not to talk to people. But we can't allow that to happen. And that's something we need to keep in mind. We must pray for the opportunities. We must walk wisely among people and then speak to them in such a way as to attract them to the gospel. What talks about our speech, number three, speak graciously. We're to buy up opportunities in the marketplace of conversation. You know, if we cause people to lose their tempers or we lose our tempers, then possibly we need to be more gracious in our approach. The term there, seasoned, is sort of interesting term. Uh, one person wrote about it, and this is the New Linguistic and Exegetical Key to the Greek New Testament. It makes this statement about the word to season. The figure of speech as salt was used in the ancient world of sparkling conversation, speech dotted with witty and clever remarks. Here it indicates speech which gives a flavor to the discourse and recommends it to the palate, as well as speech which preserves from corruption and renders it wholesome. Yeah, I'm a big fan of salt. Uh, you know, the doctor tells me, you know, you need to let that salt, salt shaker stay there on the table. I love salt. But, you know, it's great for seasoning food, but it's also a, a, a preserver. It preserves things. Well, our conversation ought to be that way, too. You know, we ought to be able to talk to people and have pleasant conversations, even when the subject matter may be something that might make us a little uncomfortable. We need to do it in a way that we can continue that conversation. That doesn't mean we just toss out things that we disagree about. That doesn't mean we just ignore the things that are controversial, but we need to be able to have a conversation in a civilized and pleasant way with people. And that's something that we need to do. There's a right way and a wrong way to answer someone's question, but the question still needs to be answered. It's interesting, in Proverbs 26 and verse 4, in Proverbs 26 verse 5, you ever read those passages? Let me read them to you. This is Proverbs 26, verse 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Well, the very next verse, the very next proverb says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, which is it? You know, a lot of people thought that was a contradiction. But, you know, it really just depends on the situation. That's how we do that. Albert Barnes made this comment, and I thought it was really good. He says, Two sides of a truth. To answer a fool according to his folly... In Proverbs 26, 4, to bandy words with him, to descend to his level of coarse anger and vile abuse. In verse 5, it is to say the right word at the right time to expose his unwisdom and untruth to others and to himself, not by a teaching beyond his reach, but by words that he is just able to apprehend. The apparent contradiction between the two verses has led some rabbis to question the canonicity of the whole book. You know, we have different situations. We have to be careful the way we talk to people and what we say. Adam Clark made this statement about it, and I really liked what he wrote. He says, Let all your conversation be such as may tend to exemplify and recommend Christianity. Let it not only be holy, but wise, gracious, and intelligent. A harsh method of proposing or defending the doctrines of Christianity only serves to repel men from those doctrines and from the way of salvation. You know, I often tell people, you know, Christianity, the, the New Testament, it, the words of Christ are offensive enough. You don't have to be nasty about it. You don't have to be sarcastic about it. You don't have to, you don't have to add those elements to it. You need to add salt to your court, to your conversation, if it's becoming so abrasive. Now, I mean, remember, Jesus was the master teacher, and they nailed him to a tree. Something we need to keep in mind. 
we need to be the kind of people that we talk to people and we have the opportunity that they want to continue the conversation, even if they don't agree with us immediately, or maybe they never agree with us. Hopefully they'll never regret at least speaking to us. So as we continue our, or conclude our lesson here on pray, walk, and talk right, we need to continue earnestly in prayer. Prayer is powerful, and be sure to make sure that we thank God. Continue to pray for opportunities for doors to open for, to talk to people. And continue to pray for teachers and preachers in the world to represent the gospel faithfully and in power as it ought to be. Use your life as an influence for Christ. Don't be afraid to talk to people. It's important that we do that. If you get the opportunity to speak to someone about the gospel, take it. Don't shy away from it. When you speak with others, be sure to do so in such a way that people, even though they may not initially agree with you, they don't regret talking to you. And maybe they'll talk to you again. Maybe they'll give you another opportunity for you to share the gospel with them. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there that people follow. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They follow things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Some attempt to change the order of the turns. Maybe they be, might be baptized before they even believe. Some fail to realize what point they are even on the map. They don't even look at the map, thinking that they're saved already and haven't even opened their Bibles yet. As a person is traveling in a car must follow the road map's directions, or a hiker, as shown here, must follow the trail map, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's consider the first intersection on our road map, believe God's word or to have faith. We must have faith, which comes from God's word, Romans 10, 17. Hebrews 11, 6 states that we cannot please God without faith. It states, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus stated this, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. Our next intersection is repent. Repentance requires a change. We must bring our life in conformity to the way God would have us to be. The Jews who crucified Christ were commanded to repent. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 Claiming ignorance will not work. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 Our next intersection is confess. A person must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. To confess this means one acknowledges both his humanity and his divinity. We must confess, as it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. If you want Jesus to confess you to the Father, then you must confess Jesus before men. Matthew wrote, Therefore whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32. The next turn on our map is immersion. Baptism is perhaps the most controversial step in the plan of salvation to some people. However, the New Testament is clear that one has to be immersed in water to obtain salvation. Notice that faith precedes, not negates, baptism. Mark wrote, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Baptism is immersion which pictures a burial. Paul wrote, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We put Christ on when we are baptized. Galatians 3.27 states, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And some people try to say, well, baptism doesn't save us. But the Bible is very clear about that. Baptism clearly saves us. Quote, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 don't let anyone try to persuade you otherwise. Read the New Testament and see it for yourself. 
Baptism is required to be added to the church, in which is the only place salvation can be found. At this point, we've reached our final intersection on our road map, the church. One is not voted into the church after some religious testimony. The Lord adds him to the church. Notice in Acts 2.47, it reads, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Once one is added to the church, they are a Christian. A Christian means like Christ. This means we follow Christ's teaching and example, both in our words and in our deeds. We then must live a Christian life regardless of the consequences. We must remain faithful in the church until the Lord returns and takes his redeemed ones to heaven. We must be faithful Christian regardless of the consequences. Revelation 2.10 states, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Regardless of what Satan throws at us, we must remain faithful to Christ. Regardless of what governments may do to us, we must remain faithful to Christ and his word. We must remain faithful. So in review, let's take one more look at our roadmap to heaven and look at the steps along the way. Number one, believe. Number two, repent. Number three, confess. Number four, immersion or baptism. Number five, add it to the church and remain faithful. Friend, where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. If we can assist you with further information for your journey, please feel free to contact us. Yeah.